coaster that uncut. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another episode of Coaster Net Uncut. We are here tonight, of course, with the the great Danny Miller. But as you may know, I count one, two, three squares, and we got somebody in the middle here. And uh, why don't you introduce yourself here? For the great listeners and watchers of CoasterNet Uncut. <laughs> All 24 of them? All, hey, we got more this, okay. We got more than 24 yeah. followers. <laughs> right. Uh, hello, my name is uh, Brian Baikady. Uh, I'm from Arizona. Uh, huge pond enthusiast, theme park enthusiast. Uh, that's all that you need to know about me. Well, at least for now. <laughs> for now, for now. So as you might have uh, surmised by this point, uh, the reason why we have Brian here this evening is because we are talking a little bit about the controversies that surround the haunt industry, especially the haunt industry as it pertains to, guess what, theme parks. And I know that we've had plenty of the stories over the last two years, even dating way back before then, about a lot of issues that surround these haunt events that, that these parks hold at, um, at, you know, during these fall festivals. So, um, you know, what we're going to do first is we're going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the bigger controversies that we saw this year. And I think the biggest one that has come out over the last few weeks uh, is this idea of uh, Halloween Horror Nights being an adult-themed event. And you've probably heard the discussions on forums and message boards. And, um, you know, I, I know, Brian, you had the opportunity to attend uh, Hollywood's HHN, and I had the opportunity to attend Orlando's HHN for the first time this year. Um and, uh, you know, there was an incident. Go figure. We had we had an incident last year, and maybe we should start there, because I really think that that's where this story starts, because I know, Brian, you have some specific uh, ideas about uh, the, the author of this story um, and where it actually originated from. But last year there was an incident that, uh, at the Bill and Ted uh, stage show that every year, <laughs> since the very beginning of HHN, uh, they've been doing a spoof. Um, they do it at both Orlando and in Hollywood. And they basically spoof and uh, make satirical references uh, to the various, uh, you know, pop culture events of that year. And it's usually pretty funny. I can tell you, I can attest to it, that this year's HHN uh, in Orlando was one of the funniest stage shows I've ever seen in my life. And I've seen a few stage shows here and there. And uh, it was drop-dead funny. It was really well done. Um, and last year, it got into a little hot water out in Hollywood when uh, some people got offended when uh, they started making gay stereotypes out of it. Um, that the basic storyline was... Superman uh, gets a fairy dust poured on him, and then he turns into the stereotypical gay man who can't do things. And the gay community kind of took up arms and and said, "That's not that's not appropriate. That just because he is gay doesn't make him less of a man." And blah 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 blah, and so on and so forth. Um, <clears throat> so Brian, I I know uh, you have. Uh, You've read that story. It was uh, I forgot who wrote it. Do, do you remember who wrote it? Oh my gosh! Oh my god! Yes, yeah, Jamie Lee Curtis from Vice.com. Let me tell you something real quick. So for those of you who know Jamie Lee Curtis, he does this uh, weekly article called Cry Baby of the Week, which is quite ironic if you ask me, considering uh, <laughs> considering I believe that he was the one who started this whole uproar. I have tons of gay friends who live in California. They love Bill and Ted. They're really sad to see it go this year. Uh, I don't think it was the gay community that had a problem with it to begin with. It was Jamie Lee Curtis and through his... I'm not. I'm going to censor myself just because I don't want to start a war with him <laughs> yet. Um, through his blog post and his just weird train of thought is where I think it all starts. And uh, 
I can't stand the guy. I honestly can't. I'm waiting for the day when he becomes the next crybaby of the week. Well, what's ironic about that is that he was at it again this year at event at the event that you did attend that you had the chance to go out to Not Scary Farm. Not Scary Farm. There you go, and and, and they also yeah, do a Farm 2014, yeah. And, and they also do a spoof event there called the Hanging, and basically they just lambasted or or, uh, how, or um, Universal Studios for basically giving in and 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 taking down Bill and Ted for this year. Tell us a little bit about that show and how and and what they did there. <laughs> so. Uh... <clears throat> So the hanging, this year's hanging was uh, subtitled "Everything is Gruesome." Uh, so when you're getting to the stage show uh, out there in Calico Square, you notice everything's frozen. I wonder why. Uh, <laughs> and there's all these signs everywhere that says this year's hanging is canceled. Uh, so after they do uh, intro musical number, uh, we're finally introduced to the uh, uh, the antagonist of this year's production. And that that's the agents of Panty Shield, uh, people who uh, absorb offensive material and content and prevent it uh, from being released to the hypersensitive public. Uh, <laughs> and it, it was a great production. Now, I've been a fan of The Hanging for many years since I first discovered it on YouTube back in 2011. Uh, so to actually see it in person was amazing. <laughs> and, uh, hey, two for one special this year. And, and what's funny about that is the same guy who wrote the story last year about Bill and Ted came out and started kind of like complaining again that the, that Knott's Berry now was attacking him and saying that it was basically a show about him. And, and everyone's just like, dude, settle down, you know, like he tried to make a whole nother article about it. And, and I understand at some point that these guys... That, that, that there is a definite business on the internet now. There's a business to stir up emotion, stir up trouble, because then you generate page views, you generate people coming into your site, that even if you have this, you know, this opinion, whether it be valid or invalid or outlandish or completely based on reality, if you can generate emotion, you can bring people to your site, and ultimately that means more dollars for you as a writer. So I, I don't know if he actually believes the stuff he's saying or if he just says the stuff to uh, to generate money. But in, at the end of the day, it just seems that a lot of people are, are not jumping on board with this, with this idea of, you know, th there's this PC backlash now of, of, you know, we can't say anything and it's it's become this world where everything is being offense being viewed as offensive. People are getting you know mad at other people all the time, and I I think we're beginning to see that backlash to that now, where people are like, okay, enough is enough. At some point, you can have a little good fun, and maybe words don't matter. Maybe we're at that point in our society where you can make jokes at things and not be viewed as a complete you know racist or as a you know an insensitive person or as a sexist or whatever you want to call it which obviously brings me to this year's HHN where we have <laughs> we have words whoa, mattering whoa, whoa, Andy Andy what's what's the, what's the event called now be careful about how you say this it's Halloween yes. horror 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 nights, horror nights. Horror. yeah yeah um <laughs> apparently Apparently, it's inappropriate to call a 13-year-old. Yeah, apparently, it's inappropriate to call a 13-year-old a whore nowadays as well. Um, and I, I just think that you know. So if you don't know the story, I'm sure you've seen it on Facebook and on other places. But as the story goes, uh, there is a scare zone inside of HHN, and uh, it's called the Purge. If you've ever seen the Purge. Um, especially Purge number two, Purge Anarchy. If you've seen it, uh, in the film, they do an auction of people. And they find, they round up these people, these uh, homeless people, whoever's out there. They round them up, they put them on stage, and they auction them off to all these rich people to go ahead and kill or do whatever they want with. So in this scare zone, you have this auction taking place. And there's, uh, at both Hollywood and Orlando, this happens. Um, I would say the Orlando one is a lot more uh, structured, where it's more of a stage play 
than it is in interaction with the crowd. Uh, from the video I've seen, and I have watched a few videos from Hollywood, it seems more of a interaction with the crowd followed by a stage show. Um, and it just so happens that there are these bunch of kids that happen to be there, and the actress uh, portraying the main auctioneer happened to call one of two girls a whore. And okay, that's weird. Are you doing math over there, Danny? No. Oh, you know what? Uh, sorry about that. My, uh, I had my uh, interactive audio notes up from my math class from the whole doing homework. <laughs> My teacher decided to decide to start talking at 9:30 at night here. So, I guess. I guess. I, I, thought, I thought that was. An, I thought it was an ass question. I was like, wait a minute, no. <laughs> Sorry. It's on <laughs> Exactly. You know, I had to. I had to give you an opportunity to do that tonight. Thank you. Thank you. I give, you, I give you every episode to do that so there you go yeah i was doing math homework before we started here and uh my teacher decided to uh, press the play button on me so. well i'll tell you what if there's anything more boring than that disney episode we did here it's you talking about math <laughs> <laughs> well yeah exactly or or old abandoned mine towns I like how Brian's just sitting there, like, staring at us, like, I have no idea what the hell's going on here. It's like, I have no idea what's going on inside jokes over here. Oh, my goodness. So, so anyway, back to the story. In the Purge Scare Zone, this actress called two girls horse, and um, they got a lawyer, and, well, you know, the the second part of their story is actually somewhat valid, where the two girls, uh, their mother was not inside the park. So write that if you're taking notes and you're, you're you're part of the jury here this evening, if you're taking notes, write that down first, that the mother was not inside the park. She was actually outside the park doing something else. And the girls went to her, said they were offended, and she went to customer service. And customer service's response was, well, we can't help you unless you buy a ticket. <laughs> And, and and here's the funny yeah, part. Exactly. <laughs> you have to pay for the right to complain to management. Yes. Oh, this, and the thing is like that. That in itself made me say, okay, tick one up for the Universal here because that's awesome. And then and then they followed that statement with, and I'm sorry, we're sold out for the evening. <laughs> exactly. Like what do you even want to miss? So, so we would like to accept your complaint or your money, but I'm sorry we don't have any tickets available. You know what? It's I'll not give, good here tonight. <laughs> I'll give the parent a, 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 I'll let her. I'll let her off on that one because if if a customer service person told me that, then I would be like, no, sir, you are incorrect. So yes, I'll, I'll give her that that the park was incorrect in the way it was handled after the event. But what do you guys think about calling a 13-year-old a whore? And I think it needs to be said in this context. I, I think that's I think that's the big point here that that you are in a certain context. So, what are your thoughts? Um, I, I guess I'll start here. Um, in this context, I, I think it comes back to what we were talking about before we went on the air. This. This is an event that is supposed to be targeted for an adult audience. You're talking about really the youngest that I think they really recommend people being there is like what, 16? Is that, that's about the minimum age of stuff. Two. Um, I think I, I said that. You know, I think if this was someone who was maybe a little older, maybe okay, you're not really offended because I mean. You hear it, in, I hear it at college, and you know, you hear it in, even in high school where you have a group of 17 or 18 year old girls that are all friends. Like, oh, hey, you're a whore, or you know, whatever. And it's, it's, it's like, okay, you don't really. And in this context, I think that's something that you might expect, but because they were a little younger, you know, maybe that's something they didn't expect to hear. So. I don't, I don't know exactly where I fall on this at this point because 
if they knew what if the the girls themselves knew what they were getting into, then maybe they should have expected to maybe come across something like that at that point. But at the same time, you have to look at the cast member. Okay, does the cast member have enough time to realize that, all right, these girls are a little younger. Maybe I can, you know, refrain from, you know, targeting them specifically. Or is that something that the cast member shouldn't have to do because maybe the girls shouldn't be there in the first place? So I'm kind of having a hard time deciding where I fall on this. And it goes back to something I've said in previous episodes where, People like to be outraged. People like to be angry about something. Everyone likes to complain about something. We like to complain about Flying Turns winning the uh, Best New Ride Award. You know, we like to complain about Europa Park, um, you know, winning the Best Park Award. We like to complain when Parks put in a, a free spin SNS ride instead of a wooden roller coaster. And we complain when Six Flags Magic Mountain makes a Twisted Colossus only half the length of the original Colossus. Uh, you know, we like to complain about stuff like that. So the park is complaining about it. Look at Brian over there. He's going nuts. But, but again, you, get, you see my point. So many people like to complain about so many different things here, and this is another thing where, okay, maybe they should have expected it, but it's something they could complain about, so they did. How about you, Brian? What do you think? Well, uh, having experience working in the haunted attraction industry as an actor, at least from my perspective, when you are setting up for a scare or being interactive with your customers, you don't really have a time to observe the situation. Uh, you, you, it's natural it's the instinct. You see people, you go for it. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to defend the park on this one. Well, except for the way they carried it out in the end, but, uh, but no, the, the park is not in the wrong here, and, uh, and for these girls, now I don't know if these girls claim they didn't know what they were getting into, uh, but it's kind of hard not to know what you're getting into, especially being Halloween Horror Night. Uh, you go to Southern California, uh, just about everybody knows what it is, they know what it entails, um, so, that's that, and, uh, uh, I had something better planned out, but it just, that Twisted Colossus <laughs> joke just took it out of my brain. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it, but I, I think, I think all of us here can agree on, a, a, on at least one thing that the way the park handled it after it happened about telling them they had to buy a ticket to complain, I think we can agree that that probably wasn't the right thing to do to avoid this becoming a big story. I think the debate comes back to what Brian said. As an employee, as a cast member, as a scare actor, is it your responsibility to know who you're trying to target? And now, I've worked at a park, but I haven't worked at a haunt. I haven't worked at a haunt event, so maybe I don't know that side. I know people who have. But I would think that you're just focused on finding someone who's vulnerable to a scare and then targeting them regardless of who they are. So in my mind, I don't think it's the responsibility of the cast member to essentially pick out only certain people. Once they're in there, they're essentially they're liable to be a target. And and I can tell you, having having built and acting in a haunt for the last six years, that I, I'll echo what Brian said, that yeah, it's you find targets, and you find targets, and they usually are a little bit younger. Um, you know, those are the ones that scream the most, that as you get older, you and begin female. to real, yeah, and female, and you begin to realize that, hey, wait a minute, that, you know, this isn't all that serious. A lot of times, like, I'll, I'll tell you this story. When I was walking through Cornstalkers at Cedar Point, there was this girl in front of us that just kept screaming at everything, screaming like someone was trying to kill her. And then we got to this open part, and she's literally laying on the, on the cement ground with a scare actor over her, physically unable to move. And I'm like, and I said to her, I said, honey, your boyfriend's all the way up in front of you. Your boyfriend's about 15 steps in front of you. He's embarrassed by you. Get up and start walking. It ain't real. At some point, 
it, I, I don't understand those people. Like, yeah, it's scary when people pop out at you. It's uncomfortable. But for the people that scream bloody murder, most of the time in my mind, it's all an act anyway. So why are you being overly offended by it? Now, I will say this. I will say that in the real world, more likely than not, you should not call a 13-year-old a whore. You know, in the real world, as an adult, you shouldn't call a 13-year-old a whore. I, I, I think, though, these events, you have to suspend your disbelief a little bit. That you are actively entering into... Um, in, into this, this show, you, you are entering into a live show and at some level, you know, I, I've seen a lot of debate online and at some level, how can you be okay with people popping out with you with knives and weaponry and be okay with somebody threatening your life, but then not okay with somebody calling you a name? At some point, if you're offended by one, shouldn't you be offended by the other two? And if that's the case, why are you at a Halloween event then? You know, that, that's the whole point of this, is to put you into situations that you are uncomfortable, that makes you uneasy, and if that's the way to do it, then that's the way to do it. Um, you know, obviously, if someone came up to me outside of a Han event with a knife, there would be a, there would be some kind of repercussion, just as if someone called me a whore. Uh, obviously, they wouldn't call me a whore, but called my thirteen year old. <laughs> well, maybe they would. I don't know. <laughs> um, well, well you, you, you're bringing up you're you're essentially going back to the point is to put you in situations that, in all likelihood, you're never going to experience in real life. And I think. I don't think a 13-year-old girl should reasonably be expected to be called a whore just out on the street or at school or at home or at a friend's house or whatever. That's something that they probably wouldn't expect to experience, but this was essentially an act. It's part of an act. It's part of something fake. So mm -hmm. at that point, I, I, I have a hard time really giving the park any more than just a slap on the wrist and say, okay, now don't call 13-year-olds whores. Well, and and I I think we at this point we should move the conversation a little bit to um, to a blog I wrote last year. That last year we had a, a different situation, but you know a situation that's basically in the same vein. And and my solution to both of these problems is actually the same. It's it's well let me let me explain the blog. So last year uh, in Chicago at Six Flags Great America they have Fright Fest. And there are scare actors roaming about during the afternoon. They um, they actually decorate a lot more um, a lot more intensely than say a Cedar Fair Park, where you'll have hanging limbs and severed heads and all this other stuff scattered throughout the park. Um, but what happened last year is you had this family go there, and I believe it was a, either a grandmother or a mother with her with her young children. And she claims that the scare actors who were out during midday were, were scaring her children too much. And she said that it's inappropriate for this to happen and the park not give them adequate notice on it. And she says, well, there are no signs out front. There was no this or no that, except the fact that the event was called Fright Fest. And um, I kind of made the point in my blog that, the simple solution is don't go. Don't go. And and here we have again with HHN. If you if you you had two girls who thought they were ready, who were completely unsupervised in the park because the mother didn't have a ticket, so she just sent them off as two 13-year-olds into a park by themselves that we all know Halloween events kind of bring out the weirdos in life. I, I don't think I'm going out on a limb when I say that. That at any time you have a Halloween event, a different type of person comes out. And personally, I don't know if I'd send my kids into that situation. Here at Great America, the mother was with them, or the grandmother with, was with them, and she said it was inappropriate. And my simple solution is don't go. Don't go. Or how about do just a slight bit of research before you go to an event? And yeah, theme parks are usually known as family places, but I'm sorry, as these things keep going more and more, 
um, at year after year, they keep ratcheting up the intensity. That, Brian, I know we were talking about before with this new skeleton key stuff. Well, you had that experience a few times uh, this year. But why don't, you, why don't you talk about the skeleton yes. key experience? So, uh, I believe it was last year, not scary far, out in Buena Park, California, they introduced this new concept called the skeleton key. Now, what that is, is you buy that. It's a, Now, their haunted attractions are free with your admission, but if you buy the skeleton key, you get access into these uh, exclusive rooms. And what these rooms are for is to propel the storyline uh, even further. Uh, and the reason why they're exclusive is because if they had to put it in the maze for everybody to go through, it would hurt capacity and throughput, and so having to pay it again to that. Anyway, uh, so it expanded chain-wide Cedar Fair this year, um, and I experienced some of those this year, and I can tell you, they get really personal with you. Uh, for instance, now I'm not saying this is the best skeleton key room I've been in. It's far from it, but in Pinocchio Unstrung, uh, I was chosen as a victim, and I was... <laughs> the best way I can describe it is uh, it was very you know, I, 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 I apologize in advance if this offends anybody but it was a very sexual situation where I was told to act like a puppet now I was constrained or not constrained but my, I had these uh, horrors coming down from the road and they had me in wrist so I was acting like a puppet and uh, it was very reminiscent of like a no, oh, what's the acronym? Uh, no, I won't go to the acronym, but it's the one that you find on that website. Um, I, I know that acronym, and uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> um, I, so there's that one. Another one, I was buried alive. I was put into a uh, tight constricting coffin, and uh, that literally scared the crap out of me. Uh, because of what happened in there. Uh, and that, that was my favorite one, by the way. Um, let's see, go what else was there. Another one, I was put through a seance. Another one, I had to feed some guts to some uh, severed heads. And uh, that one's actually a funny story. There's several uh, cases of me, uh, several podcasts and several people who were taking pictures in there that night. They documented me doing that, so uh, <laughs> that's kind of cool. But anyway, uh, uh, Gunslinger's Grave. Uh, <laughs> you are put into a room, and you witness somebody get killed, and that is very graphic, and your, your blood gets all over you, and uh, that one was quite intense. And uh, I, that's pretty much it. That's all I really have to say about Skelton and the intensity and the <laughs> personal fear that been happening well it, it seems it, it, like they're, they're really just kicking them up a notch i know my aunt did i think when she went to the day on the last weekend or the second last weekend it was weekend after i was um I, I, she said it's basically just they're kicking it up a notch um you know it's we hear about how over in Europe they have all these really super duper extreme haunts where you know they do all these twisted sort of things to you, and we don't really see a whole lot of that over here, especially not in the theme parks. A lot of that is it is well, actually, kind of its own. Good. Yeah. Okay, so I, mean, I just I just sorry I didn't mean to interrupt, but uh, yeah, like you say, we don't really see that. Yeah, Skeleton Key is kicking up a notch, uh, but we're also seeing you know other uh, add-ons, such as Trapped, Lock and Key, where you are mm. put into these situations. And this one, uh, which is the 2014 version of Trapped, uh, people are saying it takes 30 minutes for a group to go through. 30 minutes. So, uh, and, I'm sorry. And, and, and I can tell you that, like, like, even Cedar Point, that Cedar Point's pretty much known as, like, the tamest of all the Cedar Fair parks that because they're the biggest theme park, they usually don't really go all that crazy. Even they this year introduced the skeleton key concept. Uh, I had the pleasure of going through it uh, the last time I was there and well, the last show that we did. And e even that, like my sister, like they had this like animatronic fat guy and she had to put her hand into his belly 
to fish out the key to get us out of the room. And, and she said there was a whole bunch of stuff in there that was like covered in baby oil. And then, um, and then her boyfriend at one point to get out of zombie high school had to, uh, eat a cricket, you know? So, and, and obviously that's nothing like, like what Brian said, but it still shows you that even the tamest of parks is moving towards these new experiences for people that want them, that if you want to pay for this experience, then, then, then you can have it. So, uh, you know, but at the same time, Cedar Point also, and maybe I'm making an argument against myself here, that Cedar Point at the same time for their daytime activities greatly expanded their kids' events too. That, that they almost doubled the amount of things that they offer for kids to do during the day. But obviously once that nighttime portion hits, uh, you know, it's clearly marked for, uh, for adults, you know, for an adult audience. And, and that, what, that was actually one of the craziest things that I saw at Universal this year for Horror Nights is, you know, you have Islands of Adventure there. You have Harry Potter. So when, when the, it's the transition hour. So when six o'clock hits, you see this mass exodus of families leaving the park and you see this mass entrance of haunters as we'll call them uh, entering the park and it's two completely different crowds uh there is no confusing who's there for what event um <laughs> for sure and, and and i thought that was one of the most interesting things is that i saw all these families leaving and there was no question um why they were leaving because they knew that this event was geared towards adults. It is not geared towards children. So if I have a five year old being at HHN, you know, uh, after a certain time is probably not the place I want to be with that five year old. I'm sure the extra ticket price also made that decision easier for them. But, um, but you know, at the end of the day, it's kind of like read the signs, understand what you're getting involved in. Um, I, I don't see an issue with that. It's I, and it's it's very similar to you know we talk about it from time to time when we have these ride accidents about you know safety procedures on the roller coasters and the thrill rides and it's, it's the same sort of thing. It, to a certain extent, you have to take responsibility for yourself. And I, I think um, I don't know if there's other places like this. Maybe on the West Coast, um, I'm only on the West Coast. One um, so, Brian, maybe help me out if there's something like this out there. But a good example of it's it's not even a haunt. It's a year round. Well, it's not year round, but it opens with the park is on a, on Maury's Piers. And on one of the piers is the uh, ghost ship. And what it is, it's essentially a walkthrough that takes about, I'd say, 20 to 25 And it's essentially a haunt-style attraction that you walk through in small groups uh, could be a group you know, could be a group of people you don't know. I went through it by myself with a group of people I didn't know. And it's one of these haunt-like attractions. It's a couple levels, and it's on an old abandoned naval ship. And essentially, they, this is the type of haunt where the actor, they will jump out at you. They will grab you. They will touch you. They will throw you against walls. They will pop you. They will, you know, grab you from behind, that kind of thing. And I think, I don't know how many of those type of attractions we have in the states here, but I think we're starting to see a little bit of a transition towards that kind of stuff because, you know, the limit for the roller coasters is what will people get on? When people stop getting on them, we won't build them any more in tents. People go to these haunts. These haunts for parks like Dorney Park and Kings Island and Bush Gardens, Williamsburg, I know it hits capacity all the time for Halloween Stream. They're some of the most popular times of the year to go to these parks. So if people are still going to go, they're going to make them more intense until people stop going. So you know, if it works, keep doing it, right? Well, it, it's, inter it, it, it's interesting that you bring that up because we see a, we also see a new trend in the haunt industry that I, I think is really going to take off pretty soon. That We saw it this year at Knott's, and uh, I got to experience at Hollis Scream um, Tampa Bay, and that is this new idea of the interactive haunt. So maybe not so much of uh, ratcheting up the intensity factor 
but actually giving you something to do in the haunt. So what we see happen with these interactive haunts is basically you're given um, a gun and you're asked to go through an area. And for the most part, it's all been zombies uh, at, at both Knots and Hollow Scream. It's both based both based on those zombies that are so damn popular right now. Um, but basically you're asked to shoot zombies and it's actually really cool. Like I, I I'm not going to sit here and say that the zombie containment unit at Hollow Scream was one of the best things I've ever done. Um, cause it had a ton of issues with it. Uh, one of the biggest issues is the capacity that when you're handing out guns and you're sending people through this haunt, um, you know, it's a capacity issue because you're, you have to send them through small groups to be able to get the best experience. And then what happens when you catch up with the people in front of you, you know, the first person usually shoots the zombie and then no one else gets to shoot the zombie. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of issues with the hollow scream event. I know Brian, you got to go through special app, special ops infected. What were, what was your opinion of that? Uh, well, I'll begin by saying that uh, the company I used to work for actually did some similar uh, way before Knotts did this, and but Knotts took it up to a whole new scale, uh, and we didn't. Now I don't know about the uh, zombie <laughs> containment. You know that's almost like it's in a confined building. Yeah, that that was part of the problem is that it's like it was it was like a warehouse building. Okay. Well, at not Scary Farm, uh, the designer of Special Ops, John Cook. Uh, he was given the whole entire area of Camp Snoopy, which I believe is about six acres, if I am not mistaken. Um, and, yeah, was, there was that problem, you know, the per people in the front of the group got to kill more than the people in the back of the group. Uh, but you're really thrown into the storyline. In fact, uh, I was just listening to an interview with, uh, with the designers of Not Scary Farm, and they were saying that, uh, some of their operation managers forgot they were in Camp Snoopy and they just went all out. They were, they thought the actors were actual zombies and they just went away and they fired their infrared rifle like crazy. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, uh, this year, uh, Tony Baxter came back out to the Not Scary Farm and he was blown away by Special Ops from what I understand. And I was too and I hope to see it return next year. I hope to see it expand even more, uh, and, and uh, it's, it's a really great interactive, and uh, at least the one I experienced at Knott's, it was really intense as well, uh, as you're put into the storyline. Not only do you have to shoot zombies, you have to perform different tasks to propel what you do next. And, uh, I think, I think, I do agree with you, Andy, I think this is where the haunt industry will be going to. And, and I'm not saying that every single haunt is going to have this, because, well, I, I can just tell you, some of the problems with the zombie containment unit is... It, it, the basic setup was you'd be walking through, if you imagine walking through a, a typical haunted house maze, and the only difference was is you were given a gun and had to shoot the actors as they popped out at you. Part of the problem was is that when you shot them, they were stunned for 15 seconds, which I thought was way too long. Um, and they had these huge, like circles on their chest that would light up with these bright led lights and they would flash so it's like even if you were like 20 people behind and you shot them it was clear where they were hiding so it was kind of back to that old you know if you've read my blog about hhn one of my main complaints about it was their use of technology because anytime an actor popped out they had lights and sound effects and it kind of literally shone a spotlight right on where the actors were going to pop out from, which kind of ruins it for the people in the back. So the same thing was happening here with this interactive haunt. So I, I, I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of work around here that they need to figure out the kinks and being the first year that Hollow Scream did it. But from what you're telling me that this, this uh, special ops infected sounds about 10 times better. And, and I think every park at some point is going to do this. Like it's just a matter of time. Um, I, I would not be surprised at all to see every single Cedar Fair Park have one of these next year because, you know, Knott's is like the crucible where they try everything out at Knott's, and if it works, it gets moved over to the other parks. Um, if it doesn't work, it kind of just stays there and goes away pretty quick. Yeah, and actually, just a little fun fact, by the way, uh, since you said Knott's is the crucible here, uh, uh, a lot now... Obviously, they had to scale back the event for special ops, 
But at the same time, they were given directions to reinvent Aunt. And so, uh, by them reinventing their own events and distinguishing them from uh, Six Flags Fright Fest or Universal's Halloween Horror Nights, uh, this is going to, it's, uh, it's, yeah, it's definitely going to spread. And uh, once again, not to be leading the way. So the question is, Danny, would you go through a haunt like that? Because I, I know you're anti-haunt. You're, you're, you're our anti, you're, well, I shouldn't say you're anti-haunt. You're anti, nervous. you're anti-wasting time not rolling, this. riding roller coasters. <laughs> no, let, let, let me, let me settle this on the air because I've, I've, I've settled this with several people many times. And here's what it comes down to. I've never been anti-haunt. And but I've been to very very few haunt events, and here's why: I've been playing ice hockey since the fifth grade, and ice hockey starts up in the beginning of September. And throughout my entire life, even right now, right now I'm playing here at college. We have practice three nights a week during the week, and then on the game on the weekends we have games Friday night, Saturday night, and sometimes Sunday. So, um, or you know, in my youth days it was Saturday, Sunday, and JV games were Friday nights. So essentially, growing up playing ice hockey, I never had time to go to theme parks. Uh, typically, my theme park season would end on Labor Day weekend because I, I might get to a park. Um, you know, I might get to a park once, you know, I might go to Dorney Park for a few, I had been to Dorney Park for a few hours here and there for haunts in middle school on like Saturday nights after early hockey games. But for the most part, I don't get to go to the haunts, so I don't get to experience the haunt side of things. So for me, it's, I don't want to say it's an abstract concept, but for me, it's an unfamiliar concept of going to a theme park and doing all these different mazes and these walkthrough attractions and not riding rides. It's it's something that I'm not familiar with. It's something that I've never really gotten a chance to do or become big into it like Andy or Brian have. And it's not because I don't want to. Let me be very clear with that. It's not because I don't want to. It's because I always have other stuff to do. So, so again, for me to go to a theme park and not ride you know, the dark rides and the roller coasters and the thrill rides. It's it's something that I've I've never really gotten to do extensively. Um, you know, even when I went to Dorney Park a few weeks ago and I was home for the weekend, I went on a Sunday when they opened, so I didn't get to stick around for the haunt hour. I didn't get to go on the Saturday, Saturday night. I was doing something else with my family the Saturday night, so I didn't even get to do the haunt. Um, the only thing haunt-wise I really... Phoenix Fall Fun Fest and how they have their haunted antique cars and the haunted train ride and that's it's not super extreme. You ride the antique cars and they have set up and they have characters jumping out from the different themes along the antique car rides and in some cases, spoiler alert, they have a character jump on the side of your car and they bang on the top of the roof with a hammer. So that's pretty much the extent of my haunt exposure in recent years. So you can see why I'm not very well versed in this, and that's partially why I've been a little bit quieter and let you guys do more of the talking here and talking more from maybe a park perspective here because I don't get to experience the haunts like you guys do. And I, I wish I did, but it's just something that, you know, with the way hockey falls and my schedule works, I just I don't get to do it as much as I'd like to. Well, I and, and I can say that, and, and, and this is like might be a good segue that me and Brian were talking about this stuff earlier. That you know, I, I, I as, as silly as this sounds, I've never been a huge lover of haunted houses. I, I've always loved Halloween. Um, I love the idea of haunted houses. I love making haunted houses. I don't like being scared myself, actually. And and to be honest, I'm not one to, like, walk through it. I'm much more to be the one working the event than actually being the one walking through events. But I'll tell you what. This year I've had a great exposure to more different to different events, basically. Whereas before, I'd been to the Six Flags Fright Fest at Great America. I'd been, obviously, Cedar... Uh, yeah, I've been to Hollow Weekends for at least, uh, I think it's almost like seven, eight years now. Um, but 
it's it's my exposure to uh, both Hollis Scream and um, and HHN Orlando, which just really opened up my eyes to a whole new set of possibilities and how haunts can be made. And you know, I. I'm kind of hooked right now. Like, I, I'll be honest that I'm looking forward. I'm trying to figure out how I'm either going to get to Hollywood next year or how I'm going to get to Orlando next year because I love HHN. Like, I, it's my first year. I wasn't even supposed to go this year. Was not even supposed to go. But when they announced in August Alien versus Predator, I could care less about Alien, but I love <laughs> Predator. And when they when I saw that there was going to be a Predator haunted house – because, you know, HHN only does their haunt, their houses for basically one year most of the time. Now, if something's really popular, they'll roll it into a second year, but they'll redo the haunt completely. Um, so I knew that it could be a one-year deal that they would be doing Predator, and I said, I have to go. So I, I found the money, I found the time, and I said, I have to go do this. Um, next year, though, is when I was actually planning on going for my first time. Because Halloween Horror Nights Orlando is celebrating their 25th anniversary next year. And I'm sure it's going to be a huge event uh, that's going to be out of this world crazy. So I'm trying to find my way back down next year. Um, but, you know, they, they've always, like, I've obviously I put together Hauntiverse in the past. And uh, there's been a ton of haunts that I wish I could have went through, especially at Universal uh, in Orlando. Things like the Jurassic Park haunt. Uh, they, they did a Spider-Man haunt called uh, Maximum Carnage. Out in uh, Hollywood, they did an Undertaker haunt one year. So they've done some pretty crazy stuff uh, of stuff that I really love that I would have loved to have gone seen a haunted house combined with uh, combined with those, you know, properties that I love. So, you know, I'm kind of hooked. And I know, Brian, you're super hooked. You've always been hooked on it. Uh, yeah, since about 2008, uh Back when I used to live in California, and I used to be a season pass holder for my home park, Six Flags Magic Mountain, and we've always heard our Fright Fest, and we just one year we decided, hey, screw it, let's go. Went there, got hooked, and uh, went back a couple more years, and then uh, surprisingly enough, when I lived in California, I didn't go to Knott's Berry Farm or Halloween Horror Nights, but I probably got to do that later uh, this year. But uh, between uh, uh, between you know going to my first Fright Fest and attending some of the larger haunts. And in between that period, you know, uh, my family and I, we've always done like this huge theatrical, uh, not, not a actual haunted attraction, but a show scene in our, in our front yard for Halloween. Uh, I represent, er, I refer, referenced it earlier in the show. I used to work at, uh, at a haunted attraction, which is one of the top 13 in the nation. Uh, and, and yeah, uh, now Andy, if you do come out here, I do believe it's a completely different kind of atmosphere, and uh, again, this is this is giving me my plea for you to come to Hollywood and not Orlando. I can show you the world. Shimmery. Oh, I'm not talking. Oh, that's fantastic. I got a, I got a question. I got a question for you too, because I, I don't know the answer to this. Maybe this exists already, but I'll tell you what I'd like to see done at a haunt somewhere, and I'm sure this exists somewhere. So if it does, tell me. But I, I enjoy watching other people get scared more than I do getting scared myself. Is there such a haunt? Where you can vicariously like watch it from like above on like a second level and watch like you can see oh they're gonna get them they're gonna get them and then they get them can you, is there something like that uh, where you can actually watch it happen but not be a part of it to an extent now that that would be your scare zones but there's always that risk of right. the zombies or uh, the scare actors finding you uh, but uh, I can say there have been similar setups before. Uh, at Six Flags National Mountain, the Fright Fest, uh, for, there was May's Total Darkness, which, spoiler alert, is in Total Darkness. Uh, they have TV screens out in the front, uh, showing people making their way through the haunted attraction. And then, uh, at Not Scary Farm, from my research I've done, uh, there used to be this a maze called ne Necropolis. And during the second year, they had an online streaming of, you can watch people uh, go through the arena of the uh, Warriors or whatever. It, the huge thing was over there. Okay. And uh, I'll, I'll be honest. I, 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 I know. 
I think it would be really cool if you had like if it was a if it was just like a maze, like a one level maze. Set up even like let's just for lamest terms say it's set up on like a midway and it's a maze where there's just like doors where they pop out of. If there was a second level that was on top of it, and even if it was like a glass floor, and you could look straight down and see like what was gonna happen, um, I think I think that would be super cool, and I think that would be really popular. I think that would be more fun than it, it, going through the haunts themselves. It, it, it's a your your uh, your uh, idea is a cool concept, but uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, the fire codes would not permit it. Having oh, yeah, well, if you if you ever yeah not, you, when you go to a maze like you're not you, they don't have a roof above you it's wall it's yeah uh, and and, and the other the other what happened yet six flags and that's board oh yeah your your aunt's done plenty of research on that that the the fire codes for haunts and uh yeah um but yeah but you know because I, I I'm sure there's a way to do that like. Even if you, like you were saying, if you set it up on a midway, you wouldn't actually have to be above them. You might just be able to set up, like, grandstands looking over it, but the problem then is... Like a balcony is, that goes around the outside. Yeah. Like, like you probably could do, like, and almost have it, like, in, like, your, like, like, like a bowl. That, that, like, it's, a, uh, like, a gladiator arena that you're looking down upon it. That... Yeah, something like that. The, but the question is, is would it be bright enough to actually see what was happening... And then if it's that bright, is it is it too bright for the actors to actually be scary? Would be the other issue, I think. Would, would be the other... Um, yeah, um, but I, I like Brian's idea to begin with, that the scare zones are some of the most entertaining things in the world. That there are times that I go to Cedar Point, and I just sit in the scare zone, and just I'll sit there for 15, 20 minutes, sometimes longer, just watching the actors do their thing. And, and yeah. And, and you can kind of pick out where the hot areas are because if you if you've been through the scare zone a few times, you can probably find a good bench that's right next to a hot area and be able to sit there. And and and, and, and most of the time, if you don't bother the scare actors, they don't bother you. That that they might come up to you if you don't give them a reaction, they're going to move on to somebody that will give them a reaction. So that that would be my big advice. That reminds me of opening day, uh, King's Island, when you, Dwayne, my aunt and I sat outside the Cincinnati <laughs> Reds Hall and just when people went running by us, we'd go, walk? <laughs> <laughs> and how and much fun was that? that all the way, it's, it's between these two driving back. We sat there for two and a half hours on opening day, just yelling at people and, like, following people, and there was that one dude... There's that one dude with the turquoise tank tank top and the pink hair and the short jean shorts and the flip flops. That and he was like 60 years old this year. And he <laughs> yeah. by us like five times. He walked by us like five times in ten minutes. We're like, what, what is this guy doing? He's not riding anything. He's just doing laps. <laughs> Yeah, but I, I'll tell you that's some that's some good times. And and to be honest, if I was at Universal Orlando, um, you know, I could have sat in the purge scare zone all night. Like that scare zone. For as much as people are complaining, obviously about it at the beginning of our show, that scare zone was so much fun and so well put together. And, and you could just sit there and watch it. And 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 good scare zones are like that. Like they're it, it's almost. They're meant to be viewed, and they're like it's so much more fun to have an audience watching you scare people. Um, I I could tell you story upon story just from my little haunt that I do every year. It's so much fun to watch people to be scared, and it's even more fun to scare them. Like let's be honest, you know, Brian, it's even more it's, absolutely. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, just one more thing for Danny. Uh, another way to accomplish what you're looking for is to be a seasoned uh, haunt and food and you know the gist right. you know where all the hides are and you go through with somebody that's never been there before mm. uh, I'll do a quick story uh, I have a younger friend who him and I work on some projects uh, every now and then and I took him to 13 Forest Phoenix for his first haunted attraction and uh, we get in line he turns to me and he asks are there any clowns in here? 
And I'm like, <laughs> oh no, he's afraid of clowns. Uh, you know, you people. know. I go, yes, there is a clown room. <laughs> Hold on, I'm not done. This, this is where it gets fun. You know, you know that it's, you know. So, it, like I said, if you're being a seasoned uh, haunt enthusiast, you don't get scared that easily. Some things might startle you, yes. Uh, you might get caught off guard, but you don't get scared. But watching people for the first time is funny. Uh, especially that as soon as I told my friends that there is a clown room inside the 13th floor, uh, he gets closer to me and he's like, I might need to hold your hand. <laughs> <laughs> I, know, I know that exact feeling because this past summer, when my sister's softball team was at Nationals in Williamsburg, we all went to Bush Gardens one day, and it was me, and I got my mom, dad, and a bunch of the, a couple of the other parents, and the entire softball team to ride for Bolton. And my sister and I were the only two who knew about the the free fall drop inside the building, and the blood curdling screams <laughs> the first time we did that ride. And that free fall, and it ended up being all their favorite. That was their favorite. That was their favorite right there. But the screams that that train let out could shatter glass when <laughs> that track dropped. And that's ex I know exactly the feeling you're talking about. That that's it right there. That that's what I'm looking for. That that was that was, that that particular ride. It was better than the drop itself. Was just waiting for their reaction. What it happened. <laughs> oh, it's classic, classic times. Well, I I think at this point, I think we've pretty well covered our topic this evening. Um, I don't know if you guys, uh, Danny, do you have any final thoughts on the nights? Um, not so much on the haunt stuff. Uh, I do want to bring up one thing, or well, actually two small things, um, real quick. Uh, just because by the time this show goes live. Um, it'll be the last show that goes live before I am in Florida. I will be going down uh, to Florida. I'm flying down the night of November the 19th, so with any luck, this show will be live on the 14th, um, <clears throat> which me, which will be this coming Friday, hopefully. Um, so hopefully the show is live before I'm down in Florida, but I will be at IAPA with my aunt uh, Thursday and Friday the 20th and 21st. Um, and then we'll also be down at the parks the next couple days. We'll be down there till Tuesday. So the plan is to do a uh, fun spot, uh, uh, fun spot, um, America on one of the two nights after the trade show ends, um, which white lightning number 400 for this guy over here. I'm getting to it a little later than I thought I would, but, uh, so hopefully that'll be, that'll be fun. Uh, we'll be going to universal doing both parts there. Uh, we're actually staying on site. Uh, we got a very, very good deal yeah. from the Cabana Bay Resort. So we will be staying on site there. Uh, we'll also be doing Bush Gardens and SeaWorld. No Disney on this trip. We're we're going to pass on Disney this trip. I have a buddy who's working at Disney right now for school, and he said that um, he is blo uh, blocked out from getting us into the Disney parks um, pretty much that entire week because it is leading up to Thanksgiving. So we're, we're going to skip on those because they're going to be pretty busy. He said the other parks shouldn't be too bad while we're there. So uh, we're going to skip Disney this go, but the next time we're going to go because we went the last time. We usually do Disney every other trip. So that so that's one. Um, I will be tweeting and Facebook posting, and Andy said you'll uh, retweet uh, from time to time while I'm down there, especially at IAPA. It's, it's actually more of a job hunting trip for me. I got my suits today. Um, so th this, is, this is more of a job hunting trip to IAPA for me, uh, getting ready to graduate in the next year. So uh, going to go talk to some coaster companies. Going to cross my fingers here that we can get something good. I've been in contact with a few of them. I won't tell you who. But um, hopefully we can get something good out of that. And, uh, you know, I'll keep you updated while I'm down there. So um, I'm <coughs> at Dan the T-shirt guy. On, don't follow me already. And you can find me on Facebook by that name, too. And the second thing, I'll just plug it real quick because I know we're, uh, we're running kind of long here. But um, our roller coaster poll, or I'm accepting ballots for that now. now I know, Andy, uh, you already voted in that. I put mine in. Uh, getting a lot of them in from some pretty seasoned enthusiasts. We had a guy submit a ballot last week who's been on over 500 roller coasters. So, um, you know, we're, this is slowly growing and we have some fun with it in March. We turn it into our bracket challenge to kind of coincide with 
March Madness and have some fun with it. So uh, check that out. The information you need for that is on CoasterNet. Uh, if you want to be a part of that, anyone can be a part of that. So uh, I encourage everyone to be a part of that as well. It's a lot of fun. Some fun with it. And then, uh, Brian Biacchetti, if do you have any final thoughts? Thank, oh, well, thank you for joining us here this evening. Yeah, absolutely. It was a lot of fun. Show. Um, yes, I do have some final thoughts. Uh, I'd like to speak uh, really quickly to all of the haunt designers. I know you guys have been getting a lot of criticism from uh, that bloody vice blogger, uh, <laughs> hypersensitive public members. Listen, you guys keep doing what you're doing because... I'm sure, as you guys know by now, you guys are touching uh, thousands of haunt uh, fans, and you're inspiring them, and uh, some of them may be going through some hard times, and by going through your events, they get inspired, and they, they, they turn their life around. Uh, so, yeah, and uh, to all the haunt enthusiasts, please keep showing support for your favorite haunts. Uh, uh, I want to give a quick shout-out to Coach Jeanette for allowing, me, for allowing me to represent you guys at Not Scary Farm for the opening night and the press conference. Uh, and, uh, uh, there's something else I was going to do. Oh, yeah, I remember. Selfie. <laughs> that's perfect. That's great. Oh, that's awesome. Well, thank you again for joining us here this evening. Uh, you know, we, we love having different Absolutely. people and different opinions here. Um, you know, and, and my one thing I'm going to leave with all is that, you know, um, it, it's kind of like what you said is, is I thank you to the haunt, to those haunts out there that really have made it a priority to keep the fans involved. That I know the HHM people are awesome with, uh, both in Hollywood and Orlando with trying to keep the people involved. Um, you know, Knott's Berry has been awesome with, you know, giving us access to the, the, the reveal events and all that. And it's just such a great time. Um, it's actually my favorite time of the year to be at a theme park. I love going to the haunt event. Um, you know, I, I love Cedar Point during Halloween weekends that I, I was up there at least, you know, three times this year, uh, for that. And, and HHN has, has, has set that fire in me that, you know, I, I love it. And I don't want to see these things be be kind of like ruined by political correctness that that, yeah, there's a place in the world for that. But there's also a place in the world for fun, too. And to actually poke fun at some of the things that are, are, are just silly in society and maybe not as serious as people think they are. So and, and if you take exception to that and take exception to the words we said tonight, then, oh, well, it's uncut. That's what we do here. <laughs> Hi, it's on cut. Sorry. That's the first two times that we did that. They're I think. open longer. That's the best yeah. part about it. The, part it. The, the theme parks are open longer and they're making more money. You start we just saw this weekend, um, just as a as a last side note that Cedar Fairs posted record profits again uh for this last quarter. Uh and, and I I'm telling you, it's because these haunts are packed that they're making so much money, uh that they're that they're able to do great things like put out a great aliens versus predator haunt, you know, at, at universal. But anyway, we would like to thank you as always, uh, for joining us here this evening on coaster night uncut. And, uh, I'll let you Danny sign off. See you next time, folks. Brian. I don't have my own, so I'm going to rip off a knot real quick. I'll see you guys in the fog. <laughs> and as always, right on, ride warriors. <laughs> <laughs>